Testing, one, two, three. Hopefully people can hear me. Let me, uh, let me know if you can hear me. I'll be right back. All right, looks like we got people joining, that's good. Get this all set up. Looks about right. You can hear the audio okay? Oh good, all right, sounds like people can hear, that's great. So welcome to the sixth live lecture and virtual office hour for the mobile cloud programming MOOC. Today, we're going to talk about my solutions to programming assignment number one. And uh, we'll also talk about programming assignment number three briefly. And uh, if Professor White is able to join us, we'll talk about any questions you might have about programming assignment number two. Otherwise, we will uh, go ahead and to have that discussion probably through the discussion forum or, or next week after the holiday. So uh, as you all know, the programming assignment number one deadline was last night. And so now that that's been submitted, we can go ahead and go through to my solution. So let me start by going through the solution to the skeletons that were put out on the website. And then I'll give you another solution that illustrates a few other things that are pretty cool. So let's go ahead and get that set up. I will share my screen. Okay, so. Let's do that. Hopefully you can see the, hopefully you can see this. Find the right file. So well, here is the skeleton with my additions to add the capabilities that we're expecting. As you recall, we have an activity, that's the acronym activity, and we have a content provider, which is the acronym provider, and then we have a receiver that we use to clean things up periodically every, say, 12 hours or so. Let's take a look at the source code. Uh, once you took a look at the assignment, you probably realized that there really wasn't all that much to do. There's a fair amount of scaffolding to illustrate the application, but the overall assignment is pretty straightforward. So the first place where there's actually something interesting to do is in the operations uh, package. And here we have the acronym ops class. And if we search for to do, you'll see here's where we go ahead and build up the acronym web service proxy using the retrofit code. You can see here we create ourselves a REST adapter with a builder. We set the endpoint to be the, the URL that we want to use for the uh, web service, for the acronym web service. And then we go ahead and we create an instance of this class, acronym web service proxy class. And that's, of course, where the 
the method is defined that makes a call on the web service using retrofit and retrofit goes out and does all the magic with reflection and so on in order to be able to generate a proxy that knows how to marshal and demarshal the parameters that are passed and returned from the web service and uh, that of course is the real value of something like like uh retrofit is you don't have to write that code those of you who took the previous mooc remember how tedious it was to have to try to write that code it was very painful and uh, so that's a big help and then the only other thing in this class was to write the call which is pretty straightforward um, which is the acronym web service proxy invocation of get acronym results so get acronym results as you undoubtedly remember is the method that's part of the proxy interface and this get acronym results method takes an acronym and it goes and makes a web service call to there and that then goes ahead and uh, contacts the web service sends the results back and so on and if you recall and this is sort of a quirk of the way in which the the json is defined for acronyms it comes back as a list although there's only ever one item in the list which is the short form followed by all the long forms. And so what we have to do is we have to get the element zero in the, in the list, and we do that through get zero, and then we return that long forms as the result. So get LFs returns the long forms. So that's basically how we, we populate the acronym data, and everything else is provided for you here. So now we've got the results. This is what happens when we don't find an item in the cache. Now you can see when we don't find an item in the cache, we then turn around and we um, will grab the results and then we go ahead and, whoops, I think that this is wrong. This should be actually be like that. So, sorry about that. Uh, you just get the item and then we go ahead and get the long forms from the item. And then we go ahead and put those long forms into the cache. So that's gonna go into the cache. Now that's the next part that we're going to be doing, the part here that actually implements the cache. So hopefully this part here was pretty straightforward. If you took a look at the implementation of the weather service provider, the code we looked at there was pretty much identical. Here then is the acronym provider, and you had to fill in this code in a couple of places. This is really the business logic of interacting with the database. So the first thing you had to do was implement the insert method here. And as you can see, what insert does. Now, this is a little confusing to people at first. Insert is going to insert a new row into the table, which means that we're going to be inserting it into the acronyms portion as opposed to the acronym portion. Acronym would identify a particular row in the table, whereas acronyms identifies the table. And that, of course, all works with the, the URI matcher call that you see up here, which we talked about in the earlier code review. So, of course, we're not inserting into an individual item. That's really more of an update operation. Instead, we're inserting into the table. We're inserting a new row into the table. So the way we do that, very straightforward. We call the insert method of the database uh, object, which is basically a writable SQLite database object. And that goes ahead and will insert the values, which is the content values tuple, it sticks that into this table name. And if everything goes according to plan and we get back something that is sensible, we go ahead and build the response. And then we're going to notify any registered content observers that a row was inserted and we'll return the URI response. That's how you do an insert, pretty straightforward. Here's where we do a bulk insert. So bulk insert actually is what we're using here in the code. And what we do here is we are going to be inserting into the table again, so we use acronyms, and we begin a transaction. And then what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through the table, or sorry, iterate through the array of content values, and we're going to insert each one of them into the, into the table. And uh, as you can see here, if, if all goes according to plan and there are no exceptions, we will set the transaction as being successful. And then in the finally part of the try finally block, we'll end the transaction. So what this really means is that all these inserts will be done atomically with respect to other operations on the table. 
And then we go ahead and notify anybody who cares about this and return the count of the number of items that were successfully inserted. The next operation is to uh, do a query on the table. And you can see here, when you query onto the table, we're going to go ahead and get the table open for reading this time, not writing, but reading. And so we go ahead and query the table name, passing in the projection, the selection, the selection args, and the sort order. And those were all just passed in as parameters. So there's really uh, not much to do there other than forward the operations correctly to the right query mechanism. And we can also query individual items in the table. And in order to do this, we have to go ahead and localize ourselves to just a specific row. So we go ahead and we say um, the row ID here, and then we go ahead and, and basically make that what we're doing. Now, I think if we were really being proper here, if we really wanted to do this correctly, we would want to uh, add this row ID to the selection um, clause as well. And uh, that was something that we had done in the acronym in the in the weather service provider. In fact, just for kicks, let me uh, let me go ahead and fix that code a little bit because it, it should be improved so it does the right thing. Uh, let's see here. Go over here to Dropbox documents Vandy Mook Mook app Vandy. And I think this is in assignments. This, this goes on a bit, but uh, I think it's done here correctly, hopefully. Not there. I know there, there's another solution that will have it correct. All right. Try over here. Here we go. Probably this is the right way to do it. We'll go ahead and add. You don't have to actually make this an, a separate method, but um, I will put it as a separate method. And then we can go up here with query and do something like this. Selection plus There we go. That looks better. Something along these lines is probably what you want to have done here. Let me close off that friend. That way, you're basically going to check to see, uh, you're going to do a query on the ID if it happens to match the selection and the selection args. Next to do we have here is going to do an update. Once again, updates in this case are done to the table. We could also do an update for an individual a row if we wanted to. We don't really use that here, but for the update for the table, uh, you can go ahead and, and basically call update on the database, passing in the table name, the values, and the selection args. Here's the delete. Uh, again, we're going to delete things from the table. You could also do delete on an individual uh, row if. If you wanted to, we're not doing that here, but you could. So we go ahead and we delete from the table name with the selection of the selection args, and that returns the number of items deleted. And that's basically all there is for the provider. So it's basically just filling in the appropriate operations in order to do the uh, provider mechanisms. And that's all pretty straightforward. If you took a look at the other examples that we looked at, like the Hobbit example um, or the weather service example, or the contacts content provider example. Uh, these are all very similar kinds of, of operations that they do as well.
Now that we've done that, let's go take a look at the really interesting part of all this, which is the part that actually manages the cache. Go back over here, and we'll go look at the cache. So there's a bunch of things to fill out in the cache. The cache does implement the timeout cache interface. As you can see, it schedules itself to run every half day to clean everything up that's expired, or it'll also expire things whenever you call get. And let's go take a look at the to do's. So here's the, the get operation. So what get's going to do is it's going to come in and it's going to query the database to find um, everything that matches the, the column acronym that's given with this particular value. So we're, we're going to um, check for a particular column that we're going to look up, which in this case is the, the acronym that we're trying to find. So remember that the, the cache is going to have entries that are keyed off the acronym. So the acronym is the basically the, the key, and then we're going to have long form expansions, and there'll be a separate row for every long form expansion for that acronym. Notice that we do the query method call in a try with resources block, which means that the cursor will automatically get closed because the cursor is an auto closable. And so, or it has a close method, so it can be closed when it's all done. That way we prevent memory leaks. So if we don't find anything here, if we query for an acronym that's actually not in the, in the table, then we just return, we're done. There's nothing there. Otherwise, we've got something, we found something. And so keep in mind that every row has the same acronym and it'll also have the same expiration time. So the first thing that we do is we go and we look up in the cursor that came back and we actually find the expiration time that's in the, in the cursor. And that will then return to us the expiration time as a long. Now, uh, in the updated version that I'll show you in a minute, in the alternative version, we, we changed this to milliseconds. So I think this is in nanoseconds. Um, milliseconds is a, a better thing to do, but uh, if, if you want to reboot your machine and so on. So with nano time or, or with millisecond time, we check to see whether things have gone beyond the expiration time. So if, if the stuff has expired, in other words, if the current time is greater than the time that the stuff is considered to be valid, it's now considered stale. And so what we do is we go ahead and spawn a thread that will delete all the rows that have the acronym, which is whatever the acronym is. And this is kind of a clever technique because we're running a thread in the background that's going to call remove. And we start the thread. And that way, this can be done without blocking the user from the cleanup. Because the cleanup can just go in the background. It doesn't really matter. If we have not expired the acronyms, if the acronyms are not expired, then we go ahead and we're going to get ourselves a list of acronym expansions. And then we're going to iterate through the cursor, and we're going to get the next acronym expansion from the cursor, and we're going to add that to this list of acronym expansions. And we'll look at get acronym expansion in a second. So here's get acronym expansion. This is what you had to do. This basically goes ahead and takes the cursor and pulls out the next long form entry for a particular acronym, pulls out the column, the frequency for that acronym and the um, time when the acronym was first defined, when that acronym was first found, according to the acronym service. Who knows if that's actually true or not, but that's, that's what they have. So basically, we, we extract that information from the cursor, and then we make a new acronym expansion object that contains the long form, the frequency, and the since. And uh, so that's what gets put in there. And then that, of course, gets added to this list of acronym expansions. So you had to fill in that. Here is the put values method. This is what's called by the, the put methods. Both of them work the same way. They both call put values. It's the implementation method. If the list is null or empty, then we didn't find anything that the uh, table, the, the put, um, the put doesn't going to have anything to do in that case. If uh, what we do, that do then is we figure out when the expiration time is going to be by adding the current time to the timeout period, which in this case was in nanoseconds. And then we go ahead here and we create a content values 
array, an array of content values, which is as big as we need it to be to hold all the acronym expansions. And then here's what you also had to fill in. We went ahead and iterated through the array and uh, of the array of long forms. And for each long form, we went ahead and made a content values object, added the acronym, the long form, the frequency, the since, and the expiration time. And then we stuck that into the array. And when we were all done doing that for every one of the long forms, we then go ahead and bulk insert that content value array into the database using the content resolver. Because of course, we're no longer in the database here. We're in a, the cache, which is accessing the, the database via the content resolver interfaces. Here's the remove method. As you can see, the remove method simply goes ahead and calls delete on the content resolver, passing in the content URI and the particular acronym that we want to have removed. So we're going to select that by the acronym column, and we're going to pass in the acronym name. So that will go ahead and remove uh, all the expansions that are associated with the designated acronym. So keep in mind, there could be multiple rows. So this could actually delete multiple rows. And then the final method that you had to do down here is remove all the expired acronyms where ex any ac expired acronym that is uh, got an expiration time that's before the current time is considered expired. So in that case, what we do is we come up with a selection, the where clause, and the selection args, which is the current time of day in nanoseconds. And then we call delete, passing in the expiration uh, where clause and the current time of day. And as you saw, that will go ahead and delete everything in there that matches those criteria. And that's basically everything that there is there. There was just one more thing that we did, which is the uh, delete cache receiver. This is the guy that gets called back when the alarm goes off every 12 hours. And what we do here, as you can see, is we just create a new content provider timeout cache and we remove all the expired acronyms. So periodically, the expired acronyms will get removed. OK, so that is the implementation. As you can see, there's, there's really not a whole lot to it. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, so it should be easy to do peer evaluation on that. It's very localized. And hopefully, people will, uh, will have got it to be correct. And uh, the solutions are pretty straightforward. So I'll be happy to take any questions. While we're waiting for questions, I can uh, go ahead and show you another implementation of this. Why don't we go ahead and do that? Let's see, let's go back here. And I will reshare my screen. All right, let's go find the other implementation that we've got here. Yes, Vandy, MOOC, mobile. So just this morning, I added a new example to the GitHub example repository. And this is called Acronym Response Cache. And before I go through this, let's briefly summarize what we've done so far with respect to acronym application examples. The first acronym application example we did was for the previous MOOC, and that one, which is available in the previous MOOC's examples directory in GitHub, basically showed how to uh, implement an acronym expansion application that used uh, synchronous and asynchronous access to bound services to go ahead and download the JSON expansions, the JSON data from the acronym service and had a JSON parser that parsed through all that data and then uh, created the results and stuck them into a, a cache that was managed through a scheduled executor framework, a uh, scheduled executor service mechanism, and uh, then would display the results. And so that was the one that we had done before. Um, then we had the programming assignment that we just did, which was more focused on content providers and SQLite. And so we replaced the use of JSON parsing 
and we replaced the use of retro or we replaced the use of bound services with retrofit so now we're using retrofit in order to be able to download the uh, the json and, and and that takes all the json parsing out of the equation from the application point of view and then we ended up storing the data in a cache that was implemented using content providers and sql lite so that was that was the one that we just talked about right so got rid of services got rid of the um the scheduled executor service cache implementation got rid of json parsing replaced it with retrofit and used content providers in sql lite this third approach that we're talking about um basically is one where we're going to get rid of the use of SQL Lite. We're going to get rid of the use of content providers. We're not going to use bound services, and we're not going to parse JSON directly. So we're going to use retrofit, and we're also going to use a really cool feature that's built into Android, which is called the HTTP response cache. Now, this example I'm about to show you here is probably the simplest way of doing this whole application family, and you'll see why in a second. But, and the reason we didn't do this as an exercise was because the course isn't focusing on HTTP response caches. That's not the goal, although I'm gonna show you how they work. Uh, the course is instead focusing on content providers and services and other ways of accessing things. So even though this is the most concise way of doing the acronym expansion application, it's not necessarily the most useful way to learn about content providers, SQLite, bound services, and so on. So that's why we didn't give it as an assignment. This example is a little different. Also, we, we wrote an explicit ac uh, display acronym activity to display the results. That's really cool. And so we have two activities. As you can see, no content providers are used here. Here is the source code. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look. This We'll look at this one a bit more systematically because it's got more stuff. And it also illustrates some other cool things. So here is the acronym activity. This uses the generic activity framework like we always do. And it's got the edit text where the user enters the acronym, it goes ahead and sets the content view, stores the edit text to hold the URLs entered by the user, and then initializes the generic activity framework, passing in the acronym ops uh, class to use to, to be the, the uh, presenter role in the model view presenter pattern. Now, the other thing I did here is I actually have an example that illustrates how to use asynchronous retrofit calls as well as synchronous retrofit calls. So here's the interface that we use for the asynchronous version. As you can see, we go ahead and get the acronym, we trim it, we uppercase it. That's a little better than we did done before. And then as long as we got something useful, we go ahead and call expand acronym async. And you'll see how that works in a second. And then if we do the sync version as opposed to the async version, it's the same basic logic, except we call the expand acronym sync logic. When we are done and we're ready to display the results, we call the display results method. If there's nothing to show, we pop a toast. If there is something to show, we're going to spawn an activity. We're going to launch an activity, and that activity will go ahead and display the acronym. And that makes things a little cleaner. Uh, display acronym activity is just a very simple interface that's going to take a, uh, it, it's basically passed a list of, of acronym expansions, and uh, those are done in a parsable way so that they can be passed between activities. This is basically just moving the, the code for displaying the acronyms out into a separate activity so it's a little bit cleaner. So I'm not going to walk through all this code in great detail, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Here is the retrofit portion. Uh, as you can see, we have the service proxy for the, web, the acronym web service, and we have two method calls here, and, and these method calls are very interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, they both use this endpoint, which is where the web service is located, and they both have a short form query parameter that they stash away to make things a bit more abstract. Here are the two methods that we define in this proxy. We define get acronym results, which is the synchronous two-way version. And then we also define get acronym results, which is the asynchronous way of doing things. So this way, the, the get acronym results, the synchronous two-way version, will go ahead and invoke the method get acronym results, passing in the short form, and it'll block waiting for the list uh, of acronym data to come back. That, of course, needs to run in a, in a uh, background thread using, say, an async task. 
and get asynchronous results down here, we'll invoke the method passing in the short form and passing in a callback object. But this call will not block. So this call will just go ahead and do its thing. And when it's done, this callback object, which is part of the uh, retrofit library, will get invoked with either success or failure methods that will, if it's successful, pass back the list of acronym data. So this turns out to be really cool. It's really easy to do. It's not that different, by the way, from the way that we did asynchronous callbacks with the bound services and AIDL in the previous MOOC. So that's how we do synchronous and asynchronous calls. The other thing you can see here for both of these methods is we indicate some headers we want to have filled in by HTTP. And basically, by the HTTP uh, proxy implementation. And what we do here is we basically say we want to turn on HTTP response cache control, and we want to wait up to 10 seconds for the cache to be considered stale. So this is a time-based cache. And we do the same thing on both of these. And I'll show you in a second how to go about programming this once you've gone ahead and set it up here. So this is how easy it is to do this with retrofit. Uh, we also have the acronym data. That's basically the same as before. And then we have this parsable acronym expression and our, our acronym expansion. And this is just what we use to pass the uh, long forms between the activities. We're not going to go through that in detail. That's just straightforward stuff. All right, here's the acronym OPS. This is what does all the magic. You can see that this program is much, much shorter than the other one because we don't have to do any of the um, any of the provider stuff, we don't have to do any of the SQL Lite stuff, it's all handled for us. And of course, Retrofit's doing all the, the parsing of the JSON. So here's Acronym Ops. Acronym Ops implements several interfaces. It implements the generic async task ops interface. So this thing can be uh, used to hoist the do in background and on post execute methods up into the class interface itself. We're a configurable ops, so we can be used with the, the uh, generic activity framework. And we also implement callback, which, so we can be used as the target of a call of an asynchronous callback by retrofit. Come in here, we set up the cache file name. This is where the, the cache will be stored. That's the name of the place the cache data will be stored. We'll see how that's set up in a second. We then have our HTTP response cache, which is called cache, kind of a strange name, but that's what it's called. Um, and that is from HTTP. So that's coming over here from the HTTP uh, client stuff. And here we have the OK HTTP client, which is used by Retrofit to make the network calls. And uh, as you can see, it manages the cache responses and removes the expired data. So all of a sudden, we have a lot less work to do than we did before because it's managed by the HTTP cache. Here's the proxy we're going to use, same as before. Here's the generic async task. That's the same as before. We come in here. The first time in, we're going to go ahead and create a new cache instance. And this thing actually should be called uh, mcache. Let me go ahead and fix that. That's just misnamed. So it's mcache, not cache. And then down here, what we do is we create ourselves a new HTTP client from OK HTTP. And if the cache is not null, in other words, if we were able to allocate a new cache, then we're going to set that as the cache that's used by this HTTP client. Now, notice the cache itself is going to um, be a file, or it's going to open a file with this file name. It's going to store this in the cache directory, which is a special directory that Android manages on your behalf. If the memory of the Android device starts to get low, then Android will automatically clean up the cache directory. So it's a good place to put a cache. And we have up to one megabyte worth of data in the cache. And as you saw from the headers, that data will remain valid for up to 10 seconds. So that's how the cache gets set. That's how it gets set with the HTTP client. And then down here, when we make our proxy, we go ahead and we set the client to be the new OK client with this OK HTTP client. And so that then will make sure that that gets used as the client for doing the actual 
calls to the web service and that will then use the response cache properly. Uh, we set the log level to none. I was getting sick of watching too much log information come back. But if we didn't like that, we could always set it to some other value. So when we're all done, we build the service proxy. Now here's the code. The code is ridiculously simple compared to what we had before. All we do is if we don't have a call already in progress and we're doing the asynchronous version of this, we simply call the async acronym results method, passing in the acronym and passing in this. In other words, this object. And the reason we pass in this object is because we implement the callback interface that retrofit expects. So that's how that happens. And that, that returns right away. That call does not block. If the, the call fails, then this method gets called back. This is one of the methods that's implemented in the callback interface and will handle a failure result. If we succeed, we'll get this method called back by retrofit, and it'll pass back the list of acronym data. And uh, then we'll go ahead and handle the results, which in this case involves extracting the first item and just passing back the long forms. So that's how we handle success. And we'll take a look at the handle results method in a minute. Here's how we do things synchronously. This is pretty straightforward. It's much the same as we always do. If there's an async task that's already running, we cancel it. That really shouldn't happen, but just there for logic and sanity's sake. And we go ahead and create a new generic async task, and we execute it with the acronym that we're passing in. That causes this do in background method to be called. And we go ahead in the background thread now, and we invoke a two-way call to get acronym results, which will go ahead and get the results, and then get the first item in the array of results, and then get the long forms and return those from the call to do in background. That will call, call on post execute, which will call handle results. Here's handle results. All handle results does is it simply delegates back to the activity for the display results. And that, as you saw, will spawn a new activity, a launch new activity, which will go ahead and display the results. So that's basically what there is. That's really all there is to this application. It's, it's much, much shorter. All the caching, of course, is being done by, by uh, the HTTP response cache, which is implemented, as you can see, by the OK HTTP client. And Retrofit works nicely with that. They're both implemented by the same company, by Square Technologies. And uh, so that's really all there is to this whole thing. So it's, it's by far the most concise way of doing things. Um, and it's probably what you would actually use in practice. But of course, the objective of the other examples was to illustrate these other features of, uh, of Android that we wanted to talk about. OK, so that's basically the alternative example. And now we'll go ahead and take questions. Uh, Professor White has joined us here. So if you have questions about programming assignment number two or anything related to Spring or web services and so on, he'd be more than happy to take those questions. So as I start to answer the questions here about the programming assignments and other things, feel free to type other questions in. Um, OK, so someone was using an older version of assignments. This code didn't compile, but it was due to changes in the assignment. Well, it should be really easy to make that work, so please go ahead and do that. I have only one student for evaluation. It says five remaining students. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, Pretty. Why don't you go ahead and um, submit that to, well, go ahead and post that on the discussion forum. And I will make sure that that gets routed to the appropriate person at Coursera to take a look at. I don't know why on earth that happened. I don't have much insight into how the, uh, unfortunately, into how the peer evaluation mechanism works under the hood. So I don't know why it's doing strange things like that. Um, my application observe content provider of other application after I close my application. The data of that URI change notified to all observers. So how does Android invoke my observer method? Is my application still running in the background? Um, let's see. OK, so if I understand your question correctly, I think your question is a more general question. It doesn't really have anything to do with this particular um, project. So what I think you're saying is that um, you have a content observer, and that's uh, registered through an activity. And the, ac the application that that activity is running in shuts down. 
and when something changes your application is relaunched and will go ahead and handle that activity so i think that's pretty much what android does when when the um uh change observer when the uh content observer changes occur then i think android will restart the activity and then give it the on change call so far as i understand okay uh let's see there's a bunch of questions here for programming assignment number two great i will turn this over to professor white and he can take a look at some of them uh let's see so there are All right. three questions one of the second question is more about right there. Okay, let's see here. Um, I was looking for apps that demonstrate push to sync and push to pull as you elaborated on the videos. Will they be provided? Uh, we probably won't have time to pr uh, provide any examples of push to sync and, and push to uh, um, pull, but um, since we don't really cover the, the specific Google Cloud messaging uh, platform in detail, but that's definitely something we can add in, in future ones. And there's probably some open source apps out there that implement this. So I'll go and look and see if I can find any um, examples that are pretty simple and, and point you to them. Um, if you can post that question on the forum, then I'll try to follow up with uh, some examples of open source apps that do it. And then if there's time by the end of the class, I'll, I'll provide an example that does that. But uh, the, the basic mechanism is, is that you receive a, a push notification and then you would do something that looks very similar to what you would do for the weather assignment or any other one where you would go and use like retrofit to make a call to fetch data. Um, so that's a, a, the basic way that it will work. So I'd like to know more about the programming assignment too, especially set video data and get data, as I feel it's pretty difficult to implement the multi-part data-related code. Is there some examples that we can reference? Um, the multi-part uh, portions should be pretty straightforward. Um, if you, uh, it, it, the multi-part handling is already set up for you in the skeleton that you're given. Um, and I believe that there's an example in the code base that has multi-part data. If you uh, go ahead and post uh, on the forums, I can provide a link to an example. And um, there's definitely, I have other examples out there. If there's not one that's already in the repository, I'll add one that has multi-part handling. Um, if you can be a little bit more specific about the, the problems that you're having or what's confusing, then um, I can try to follow up in a minute here with with what's uh, the challenge you're having. Um, is Spring Boot just the development framework, or can we use it for real apps in a production environment? Yes, it's absolutely a framework that gets used all the time by enterprise applications. So uh, it's a, a it's, it's normally thought of as a very hardcore, like enterprise framework that um, gets used in banking and finance and other things all the time. So it's absolutely production ready um, type framework. And it's, and it's really all it's doing is pulling together the existing spring libraries that have been around for a very, very long time and are very, very well supported and making them easier to use. So Spring Boot is absolutely ready for um, production environments. Um, and it's basically the spring framework underneath it and all of the various sub projects of spring is what it is with a little bit of extra syntactic sugar and things to make it easier to use. So it's, it's definitely ready for prime time. Um, I think this is one for Doug. Uh, and so, Doug, do you wanna take this one? Um, it's in the put values method. And I oh, think, yeah, can you, can you do the one that's about the this one? Okay. Um, so get dictionary.py, I'd like to know what the meaning and whether it's um, Python related. That's really just saying go and send a request. Um, if, you're, if you're talking about at get 
be in the annotation for retrofit. That's that's really just a uh, um, a path that you're sending a GET request to, and it's not necessarily specific. Uh, the code that you're creating is not um, Python related, but you're sending a request to some code on the server at that path, which could potentially be Python related since it ends with .py, but we don't really know. It could you could have dictionary.py be the path that's receiving the request, and it could be implemented in Scala or Go or, or C++, and there's really no way to know. It's just a basically saying, here's the path that you should send the request to. But how that path, what happens on the server side, and what the code um, is that's receiving and handling that request, there's no knowing if it's Python or not. It looks like it might be Python because of the file extension, but we don't know for sure. Are the examples in the examples directory related to code samples that you're referring to in the video lectures? Uh, yes, so a lot of, particularly the extensive code walkthroughs, those should all be in the examples directory and um, all of the examples are designed to show all of the concepts that are covered in the video lectures. So they're definitely worth going and looking at. All right. I was trying to run the video service with DynamoDB example, and it seems like the unit test fails. It looks like the resources mapper isn't suppressing hate OS that the spring data defaults to. Should we just modify the retrofit client, or is there another fix? Uh, I think this is probably a result of having um, the older version of Spring Boot that a lot of the examples are based on allows you to override the hate OS um, format that makes it slightly more um, or not quite as straightforward to consume the data that's coming back from it. So you can either change the model in the retrofit controller that it's expecting to have resources and other things that are going to match the format that comes back, or if you use the older version of Spring Boot, there are some overrides that I've got in there which should automatically take care of that for you and make it so that it's um, pulling things out in a way that matches what the unit test uh, are expecting. So you can either override it um, if you're using the newer Spring Boot, or you can keep it the way it is, but you'll have to use the older Spring Boot to make it work. Uh, in addition to Java and Spring, there's also Groovy and Grails. How really does one decide which framework to use? That is a good question. I don't, I don't think there's any single answer to this. It's a, a combination of looking at the maturity of frameworks, looking at what languages you and your organization are comfortable with. Um, you know, there, there's there's no one right answer and there's no one right way to choose. And it really is, is you know, project and context dependent. If your organization has lots of people that know Groovy, then you are probably better off going with Grails. If you're lots of Java programmers, you're probably gonna be better with, uh, you know, more of, of the Java-based Spring. because Grails is actually built on top of Spring, so um, you could use either one of those. If you have lots of Ruby programmers, you want, might want to use Ruby on Rails, um, but then you have to think about performance considerations and other things. So there's no one right answer or one right framework. There's lots of great ones out there, um, and Spring is one of the ones that I think is, Spring Boot in particular is one of the ones that I think is one of the great frameworks out there for this stuff. Um, In assignment two, do we need to use at AutoWire to annotate the data structure of the stored videos? Um, it's not clear to me exactly what you mean by annotate the data structure of the stored videos. If you can post that on the forums, um, I'll try to follow up a little bit. Uh, you know, depending on how you structure your application and your configuration, you may or may not need to use at AutoWire. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it. So if you can provide some more examples in the forum, I, or more definition on the forum, I can follow up on that. Um, I was trying to integrate Jersey and Spring. I had some trouble as Jersey and Spring ran into different containers. Um, I know it's possible to use Jersey and Spring. Um, it's not something that I've done 
uh, in the past, but it's certainly possible, I think, to use them together depending on what you are trying to use. If you're trying to use, for example, Springs dependency injection, you can certainly use that. Uh, with Jersey, there should be ways to do that. If you want to use, um, you know, Spring data, just standalone, you can use that standalone without actually having even dependency injection. It's a little trickier, but you can do it if you want to use something like that with Jersey. So it's hard to know unless you provide exactly which pieces you're trying to use and, and what are the issues you're running into. It's really specific on your setup and which parts of Spring you're trying to use. Um, well, we have a chance to do assignment that will be usable as an example um, for future jobs, some clean, not robust tasks that we can do just to see a proper way to use some of this knowledge. You know, a lot of these assignments really are sort of the uh, uh, good frameworks for something that are representative of building a full-blown application. But the thing I would encourage you to do is to take all of the MOOCs in the sequence and then take the capstone project at the end, which really is building an application from scratch like you would for a job. Uh, there are really some spectacular applications and implementations um, that we saw last year from the capstone project. And there will also be lots of sponsors looking at uh, those capstone projects. Um, Google, Amazon, there's lots of interest um, in those projects and what people are doing. Yeah, and also assignment uh, three is, is a very large application that will give you client and server side experience um, for building a significant application. Um, this last question looks like it's for Doug, so okay. I think I'm going to switch around. Hand this off to him. Great. Uh, will we go into the details of the MVC pattern? Uh, so I'm not quite sure whether you mean the model view controller pattern, uh, which we could talk about, although it's not very relevant to what we've been doing in this class, or the model view presenter and the uh, MVP pattern, which is what we've been using as the basis of all the applications that I've been covering in the MOOC. And so uh, I'd be happy to talk about either one. But uh, model view controller isn't really something that we've been focusing on. You can find enormous amounts of information about model view controller, which is one of the earliest uh, architectural patterns of decoupling the various roles and responsibilities in, in user and data-centric programs. There are probably hundreds of articles. And if you Google model view controller, you'll find all kinds of stuff. Uh, model view presenter is much more interesting and uh, for relevant to the kinds of things we've been talking about. And I'd be happy to talk about that pattern. Uh, we could do that next week if you're interested during one of the, the virtual office hours. If you want to take a quick overview of Model View Presenter, just Google Model View Presenter, and it talks about the pattern. And if you take a look at the source code for the various examples that we've put out, like the weather service provider and uh, other ones that we have, you'll see that they all explain how each of the classes, the main classes in the different packages, implements the appropriate role in the model view presenter pattern. As a general rule of thumb, the activities form the basis for the view part. The providers and SQLite databases typically form the model part and or interacting with the web services where they get the data to, to build the model and or refresh the model. And then the operations or ops class or classes typically provide the, the presenter portion. So that's the MVP mapping. And if you take a look, all the examples we give use that particular organizational structure. I uh, just want to re kind of deepen a few things that Professor White was just saying. So we have a new programming assignment that's coming out. Let me go ahead and, and bring up that programming assignment. Let's see if I can find where I put it and show it to you. Let's see, there we go. Assignments, assignment three. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen. There you go. So what I'd like to do here is give a quick overview of the third programming assignment. And uh, I put this up on the web last night and sent out a uh, description in the announcements page and through email pointing you to this file. 
then I've also, uh, we're just about ready to make this live in the peer graded assessments part. Now, this is a course on programming cloud services for Android handheld systems. Assignment one, which was just completed, focused largely on programming the Android handheld systems portion of cloud access, where we're getting the content for the acronym expansions from the cloud, and then we do things to, to program the cloud service part using a content provider, which is a very common model of accessing content that's remote, largely. Um, assignment number two, which is what you're working on now, hopefully, which is due in an, about a week or so, that uh, programming assignment is going to, it focuses on programming the web server side, the web service, in this case, a video service, using Spring. And so at that point, you'll have knowledge of how to implement the service side. The client there is provided to you in the auto grader, so you don't have to write the client, but you write the service. In assignment one, of course, you, you didn't write the service, you wrote the client. So you have experience now with client and service in isolation. And there's also then the um, third programming assignment, which combines both. Obviously, it makes sense to have an assignment that gives you experience with the service side and the client side to bring them together. And so that's what's described here. So this is what's called a mini project. This is one where you do the bulk of the work. We're going to provide you with an example that I'll go over next week. But uh, you're free to do this any old way you want. It's just an attempt to give you more experience doing something from scratch, as one of the earlier questions uh, focused on. The client side of this app runs on an Android device, and it uses content providers to store videos and associated metadata of the videos on the device. And then it uses Retrofit to upload and download the videos to an extension of the web service server you implemented in assignment two. So you basically have to have your video service working and extended in ways we'll talk about in a second in order to be able to do assignment number three. So this will give you a chance to continue to do some service stuff. And then, of course, you also have to provide the client side as well. And this will build upon all the material we've covered in the MOOC. So here's what you have to do on the server side. You need to extend the web service so it allows each video to have a star rating associated with it, where five stars is the highest rating and one star is the lowest rating. And if you've ever used you know, Amazon or Netflix or whatever, you're very familiar with the concept of rating videos with stars. The video service should enable clients to store the star rating of a video anonymously. In other words, there's no need to track or identify the identity of a client. The next MOOC in the sequence, MOOC number six on mobile cloud security, uh, mobile and cloud security, will show you how to set up accounts so you could actually keep track of who liked the video, not just did they like the video. And that, of course, is the right way to do it, but we didn't want to have to cover that in this MOOC. So that'll be covered in the next MOOC. And then the video service must enable the client to obtain an average of the star ratings of a video. So if you go ahead and add you know, 17 different ratings of a video, what you want to be able to do is then query it to find out what the average is. And again, that should be very familiar to anybody who's used the uh, Amazon or uh, Netflix or other, other things that rate stuff. So that's the service side. That's, that's going to be pretty straightforward to implement, just adding to what you've already done for assignment two. Then there's a bunch of stuff on the client side. Now, at first, this looks complicated. and um, So don't worry. There, there's a lot of pieces, but a lot of this stuff is pretty straightforward. And we're going to provide you with an example here shortly that will give you a, uh, a way to do this without having to rewrite everything from scratch. But you're welcome to rewrite everything from scratch. So it's up to you how much you leverage what we're going to give you. The uh, client, of course, has to be able to handle runtime configurations robustly. And it has to be able to handle screen rotations while videos are being uploaded and downloaded. And, and of course, if you use the model uh, view presenter pattern, and if you use the generic activity framework that we've been talking about and using, that is a piece of cake. So that won't be hard to do as long as you uh, have been following along with the other examples. You have to use retrofit to communicate to the video service. Uh, and make sure that you don't block the UI thread when you do retrofit calls. You could do that either by having an async task to do them or using the async versions like we showed in the alternative version of the acronyms implementation for assignment number one. 
So you should be able to upload a video by making the right retrofit calls. And you either want to allow people to record a video or use the Android uh, gallery application to get a video that happens to already be on your device. And you could get it there, of course, any number of ways. So you have to implement one of those things. You're, you're optionally free to implement both. It's not really that hard to do both of them. Um, if you decide to get a video from the gallery, make sure that you use client API version 19. And actually, you should probably be using version 22 just to make it easy for everybody. Um, so the, vi the, the example application we're going to put out will show how to capture a video and upload it to, uh, to the server. And so you'll see how to do that. So you could follow that if you want, or you can do it your own way. The client should limit the size of a video to 50 megabytes or less. That's just to keep from swamping uh, the net. I would recommend that you, you use much lower number than 50 megabytes for testing just to avoid uh, annoying problems, unless you're doing it on your, your, your uh, laptop, of course, or your workstation. So that's sort of uh, capturing videos and uploading them. You can download a video from the video service by making the appropriate retrofit calls. Videos can either be stored in internal or external storage. It's up to you to decide what to do. If you've downloaded a video, you should be able to play it. Uh, and you can either implement a video view, or you can use an action view, an implicit intent to play a video using another video app on the Android device. That's pretty much pretty straightforward. We'll, we'll show you some examples of that, but that's not too hard. The client should be able to give a star rating, a one through five star rating to a video and upload that information to the video service via a retrofit call. So you need to be able to upload that. And of course, that information when it's downloaded can also be stored in the content provider as well. The information about the recorded videos are stored in the Android Media Store content provider. And we'll show you some examples of how to do that. That's, that's typically where things get stored when you record a video or videos are available. Uh, to the gallery. They're actually stored in the media store content provider. And you can query this to get information about the videos stored in the device. And uh, of course, you should be using a cursor loader or async query handler or an async task or whatever to access the data from the content provider concurrently to avoid blocking the UI thread. And then you're going to have to implement your own content provider to store the video metadata. And you'll have to keep track of things like the ID, the title, the duration, the content type the URL on the server, and the star rating. You're welcome to provide additional fields if you want, but those are the ones that you need to provide. So this, of course, will give you a chance to, to build your own content provider. And naturally, you're welcome to leverage what you've learned all to this point. And then you should also be able to make the right calls to get the list of available videos and the average star ratings and display them on the device. So that's basically a way of kind of browsing the server to get the information. Here are the standard libraries you can use. Um, yeah, obviously, you can use anything that's packaged with Android, and you can also use these libraries as well. We don't want you to use anything beyond those, but those are the ones you can use. There's a bunch of hints here about how to do the implementation. So um, this tells you how you can get information about videos from the, the gallery and using the Media Store content provider. Um, this tells you more about the content provider. You can query them using this URI. We'll show you an example of that. If you take a look at the auto grading test from assignment number two, you'll get some hints on how to upload and download videos, which is a useful thing to know how to do. You're welcome to use any of the components from assignment number two and implementing assignment number three. And naturally, you can reuse code from anything else you've done, as well as any of the example code that we provided in the MOOC. So uh, even though it looks like you're starting from scratch, you're well advised to leverage other stuff that you have been exposed to. And uh, you'll find lots of, of code that does a lot of these things already existing in other things we've covered. OK, so that's an overview of, of assignment number three. And let's see if there's any questions here. Keep take those. OK, let's see. Oh, good. So let's let let's Jules take those. Uh, in assignment three, I'm going to want to save my video database between sessions to make debugging easier. What is the quickest, easiest way to make the server database persistent? Um, if you post that question in the forums, I'll follow up. There's a couple. There are a couple of things you can add to your application.properties um, file, and I'll describe how to do this. Uh, if you'll post in the forum, 
that allow you, depending on which database, embedded database you're using, that um, um, I can provide a quick example of how to do it with the H2 database. But there's a couple properties that if you provide in there, that'll tell Spring to automatically make sure that it persists the database and the path to persist the database too, um, so that you can keep it around between restarts. Although sometimes, actually for debugging, it can be easier not to persist it, and that way you can run a series of unit tests that have the expectation that the database is completely empty from the start, so that you can prep it, insert some stuff, check that it's in the state that you expect. If you keep uh, persisting stuff, it can be um, harder or more complicated to write tests that account for that sometimes. Uh, will there be any coverage of the asset pipeline for Spring? Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover the asset pipeline in Spring, and we sort of made choices about which things we thought were most relevant to building cloud services for mobile devices. The asset pipeline is great, particularly if you're doing you know, web-based applications um, where the browser is really 